Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Justina Mukoko, the National Director of the Zimbabwe Peace Project. This is a painful and inspirational conversation. <music> Justina Mkoko, delighted that I've finally pinned you down. Um, you've been running away from me. Uh, <laughs> welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you very much, Trevor. And um, I'm also very delighted to be here. Excellent. Yeah. So, Justina, you, as I was saying off air, you're one of my heroes. And, um, <laughs> you know, when I look at you... Um, a couple of things happen. You, you, you remind me of the brutality um, of ZANU-PF, uh, the inhumanity uh, of ZANU-PF, and the extent that um, ZANU-PF and this, the, the Robert Mugabe government mm -hmm. um, could go to the extent to intimidate you Mm -hmm. um, harass you, mm -hmm. torture you. Yours is, a, is an amazing story. But also you, rem you remind me of amazing strength of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, your courage inspires me so much. And I'm hoping through this conversation for us, I know it might get painful at moments, uh, that we delve into what you went through. Mm -hmm. Have you fully recovered from what you went through? When you go through this, Trevor, you don't fully mm. recover. Mm. You do not regain your former self. Mm. You are wounded for life. You are able through therapy to get healing here and there. But there are times when December 3 arrives, mm. I go back mm. to that day when I was held out of the house. Mm. And um, that also eats mm. into me. Mm. So you don't fully recover. And, and, and um You've gone through therapy and, and, and that kind of stuff. We will get into those issues. Let's, but let's go back to December 3, 2008. You were abducted, then detained for quite some time. You were tortured for an extended period of time. What crime had you allegedly committed? Nothing. Nothing. It's the work that I do. Mm. I work for the Zimbabwe Peace Project and we monitor and document human rights violations. Mm. And what we do, we emphasize who did what, to whom, mm. when and how. And we name and shame perpetrators. Mm. And I believe that was my crime. Mm. Being able to document things as they happened. Um, I think a lot of people feared that um, probably they will, uh, justice will catch up with them mm. in terms of the work that I was doing. Mm. And take us through, so you get abducted yes. in front of your 17-year-old son yes. and he witnesses all this stuff um, and you get detained for some time. Mm -hmm. Briefly walk us through, you're abducted, you're mm -hmm. actually in, a, in your night dress. Yes. Uh, and then taken to various places. Mm -hmm. Walk us through what to you um, the painful moments, the highlights of this horrendous um, ordeal that you went through. It's a, it's a dawn. 
and my son knocks and says, Mama, there are visitors at the gate. Around 5 a.m. Mm. And I'm like, who comes and visits you at 5 a.m.? Mm. My vacation was actually supposed to start on that day. So I said to him, you guys go and deal with the visitors. In no time, he was back. And he says, Mama, the people at the gate are actually police officers. Mm. And what struck me at that time, I just thought that probably a neighbor had been robbed and the police wanted to know if I had seen or had anything. So I quickly grabbed uh, a dressing gown and walked barefoot. I didn't even have my glasses. Um, and I thought I would just be, because I knew mm. I had not committed a crime. Mm. And uh, I was confronted by these huge men. There were six of them, five men and one woman. Um, so as I am approaching the kitchen, they come and um, come. The one holds my right hand and the other my left hand. That was after I had confirmed that I'm just in Amkoko. I then said, can you give me time to dress? They said they did not have time. And there I was force marched out of the house. It wasn't just my 17-year-old son. Mm -hmm. I also had a six-year-old nephew. I was staying with at the time um, and they all saw this and my two helpers, the one outside and also the one in the house. Mm. Uh, and they were shouting as we were walking out to say, we just want you to look at a file that we have got in the car and uh, once you tell us what we want to know, we can leave you. But why are you holding mm. my hands with so much strength? And uh, when we got to the gate, it was an unmarked car, mm -hmm. uh, a silver Mazda Familia, and um, I was bundled in the back. There was another man who was sitting to the right as I got in, and then the other one who followed immediately after me. And I was told to have my head on the lap of the man on the right. I'm not sure when he last had a bath, uh, but it was, as I was taking my head down, mm. I noticed that there was a rifle mm. on the floor. Mm. Immediately it hit me that this was no ordinary arrest. Mm. I actually knew it was no arrest. And uh, there and then I noticed that uh, uh, music went up. They hardly spoke. It was through their eyes. Um, and I could also, I also sensed that there were other vehicles because five men and one woman came into the house. Uh, and there, there was only four of them in this vehicle. So the others must have uh, gone to another vehicle or other mm. vehicles mm. that they had. And we drove from Norton at high speed um, with this music blatting out and uh, that's when my thoughts were going round. I was not dressed um, and I did not know these people and what was going through my mind, I was thinking it was either CIO or ZANU-PF militia because mm. those are the ones that we dealt with at my workplace in terms of people being abducted and people being tortured. And I started to think, but what had I done mm. of late? The day before I had um, presented a statement at uh, a function of uh, the Women's Coalition of, uh, of Zimbabwe. And uh, probably uh, I, I was thinking, is it something that I said there or what? Um, you know, you, yeah. you begin Your to think. Your mind is running. Yes. And um, it was, I think, after about 20 minutes of driving, the woman then says, what time are we getting to Mutari? I think they wanted to disorient to just, yeah. me. Um, and then about um, 10 minutes after that, they um, passed signs with their eyes. And the man on the right then picked a woolen item from the floor and he covered my face, mm. even covered my nose and my mouth and uh, 
I complained that I couldn't breathe. Mm. He then lifted it a bit. And uh, within a few minutes, the car came to a stop. Um, that music had stopped. But at this house, there was also music blurting out. Mm. And I was wondering where I was. They took me into a corner room. It looked like a pantry uh, because it had these shelves. And I was asked to sit down and the woolen item was removed. And they changed that with um, a dirty mutton cloth. Um, and I was left there and the door was locked. Mm. Um, within a few hours, my ordeal had started. Mm. Um, I think there were five or six of them who came. And when the um, blindfold had been removed, um, I started being, quest being questioned about my relationship with the MDCT. Mm. I had no relationship with the MDCT. Um, they made reference to a trip that we had made as ZPP staff to Botswana. Uh, and I was told that that's when you went and left some people who were being trained in Botswana. And that was all lies. And uh, it seems that I had actually been followed all that long because I had one staff member who used an emergency document. And that was spoken about it mm. there as mm. well. Mm. Um, and then they asked me about someone within the MDC who I said I did not know. And that's when my torture started. Um, there were these two men. One was tall and the other one was a short guy. And they had these two truncheons. One was a horse kind of a thing. And the other one seemed to have been, um, it had wire on it. Mm -hmm. And I was told to stretch my legs and they were beating the soles of my feet. Every time I said what they did not want, I would get a beating. Um, and this went on for the entire day because they were saying I was recruiting for the MDCT um, and then having young people being sent to Botswana where they would then come back to commit acts of sabotage and terrorism to remove a constitutionally elected government. Mm. My doctor asked my son, do you think your mother is capable of this? She said, he laughed his heart out and said, they don't know what they are talk ab talking yeah. about. Um, and so for an entire day until it got quite dark. At that time, I actually thought that I would see my feet, blood splashing out of the soles of my feet onto the walls um, because the pain I was feeling in the feet. How, so how, how long did this, so December 3, and how long did this uh, torture, uh, dehumanization, how long did it last? There would just be breaks for food. Mm -hmm. And initially in the morning when I got there, I told myself I was not going to eat. So I told them I had a stomach bag, so I didn't want to eat. But after going through the initial I think probably it was from about 9 a.m. to about 12 or 1 because that's when the lunch came. I had no energy. Mm. And uh, initially I thought I was going to, initially I screamed. Mm. But um, I then told myself screaming will give these guys satisfaction. Mm. I am not going to scream. So I would really keep the pain inside. And it was when they would go out that, you know, the, the, the lump mm. in the throat would then give in to, um, to me uh, getting emotional. Mm. And when lunch came, because I had no energy at all, I took it and um, had a bit of sadza. It was served with cabbage on that uh, first day. And immediately after I finished, they came back. And uh, the beating went Started. on. 
there was a desk in the room um, this height mm -hmm. I was sitting on the floor mm -hmm. and at one time I was asked to raise my feet on that desk and what they had done was I think they had come to Mpezanamo or something to get a dress because I think they noticed that I was in my night clothes and all so I was given a dress um, initially I said I didn't want and the woman who came said if you know what's good for you you need to put this on and then she spoke something about the toilet because she also had plastic shoes uh, so I had to put on those plastic shoes so I was told to remove the plastic shoes and I was like you have just asked me to put them on so I would raise my feet for them to and you them. know the indignity of your dress then coming down coming down and the beating going on um, and you know these were um, men who had who were strong, um, applying all their power on the soles mm -hmm. of my of my feet, and they continued to say, "Well, you are going to speak," mm -hmm. but I had nothing else to tell them. The people mm -hmm. that they were asking me about, I did not even know them. And at one time, they said, "Who do you know at MDCT?" And I said, I know the people that you probably know mm. because they're always in the news. Mm. That's how I know them. Um, Meanwhile, what's going through your mind? What's going through my mind is my family can no longer account for me. They don't know where I am. And at that stage, I was worried, will my son be able to relay this message to people, mm. to say my mother has been abducted. Mm. Mm. What I had also done, because remember 2008 was the election year, yeah. there was a time when we thought we were at risk as human rights defenders. And at times I wouldn't go and put up at home. Mm. I would put up with friends, um, just trying to disguise where I would be. Mm -hmm. And that was the time when I told him that if anything were to happen to me, these are the people that you call. Mm. And I'm told the first phone call that he made was at quarter past five mm. in the morning mm. to say that some people came and they took my mother away. Mm. I don't know where they took her. And that's when the message started, started moving, moving. Uh, moving so, around. So like I say, this is, this is um, December 3, 2008. This lasted what, um, six months, nine months? You're being held uh, your abduction? They held me in Comunicado, where people did not know where, where I you was, were. for 21 days, 21 days, which was three weeks. And at that stage, I actually remember uh, my lawyer saying, I went to court, but I thought they had done a tondera indira mm. on you. Mm. Mm. Even my family thought, I had died mm. because when you begin to look for someone the first hour, the first day, the second day, the week 21 is, days. The week is up, the second week is up the third week. and you are in the third week. You actually do not think that mm. that person mm. would be mm. alive. I, I read in your book, um, which um, you have written to share your deal that you you start singing church songs yes songs that you remember your mother singing mm -hmm. S talk to me about that loneliness um and the pain and the horror being kept in solitary confinement can actually drive you mad because you begin to hear voices mm that are not there. For some reason, I found, um, you know, the Gideon New Testament yes. Bibles. Yeah. I don't know who had left it there. I would pick um, verses from there, Psalm 23 and all. But at the end of the day, I thought the person that I really needed to be strong were my son and my mother. And uh, what I knew was that if my mother was happy, there were songs that she sang. Mm -hmm. 
if she was sad, there were songs that she sang. And somehow when I, I didn't know the, the word, all of the words, so I would hum them. But somehow they brought me close mm. to my mother and I kept on praying for her strength through all this. Mm. My sister passed away in 2003 and we're only two girls. And uh, I was thinking to myself, if these guys are going to kill me, it means that her girls are done. Mm -hmm. So I needed somehow to strengthen her remotely. Mm -hmm. And somehow every time I sang these songs, they brought me close mm -hmm. to my mother. You know, I, I say you are my hero because I, I cannot imagine myself being able to survive uh, your deal is outlined in your book uh, for, for 21 days. Um, did you at any moment feel, let me give them, let me tell them what they want to hear. Did you, did you feel you ought to give up at some point? Talk to me about I that. I had nothing to tell them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had nothing to tell them and they wanted a confession. There was one day I was taken to, I believe it's a house on Enterprise Road. Mm. Um, I always get goosebumps when I pass that house. Mm. They have recently done the wall outside with red bricks, but it used to have panels. Um, every time I look at that house, I actually think that was the second interrogation center that they took me to. Mm. In the way that that house always remains closed up, it also just speaks to mm. my suspicion. Mm. So they wanted you to make a confession? They wanted me to make a confession. Did they tell you what confession they wanted from you? Um, they wanted me to confess that I was working mm. with the MDCT mm. to recruit for them mm. and send young people to Botswana. Mm. But there was no place in Botswana where people were being trained. Mm -hmm. I had the rare opportunity of meeting someone from Botswana Foreign Affairs, who when he was introduced to me, he said, I can't believe this is the young woman who made us run around in 2008. Mm -hmm. I said, run around for what? He said, we had to clear our name to demonstrate to Zimbabwe that there were there was no training camp wow. in Botswana. He said at the last moment, the people were supposed to come from Harare to join them on this trip. Mm. For some reason, they did not make the trip. I think they knew that there was no camp mm. in Botswana. So I think they wanted me to say I was being sent by the late mm. Morgan Changirai mm. to um, recruit young people to go to Botswana for the training, mm. but I was not involved in any mm. of that. Mm. Do, do, do you now know who the people that tortured you are? Um, I know people who were in the second detention center. Um, there is, um, I think he's retired now, Asha Tafumane. Mm -hmm. I think he deals with war veterans. And then there was also, um, I think it's Simon, I can't, be, I can't remember his, uh, his second name, but he was head of, CIO, of CID at the time. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who wanted to use a bamboo stick at the second interrogation center to beat me up. Mm. Um, and the others then said, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, and then he stopped because he was very angry that the guys at the other detention were not beating him enough. Were not ex that, those were his words, mm. that you are treating him with kid gloves. Have you met any of these people after being released? I met this um, Simon, Simon man, guy. This Simon guy at the airport. And? We came together from Cape Town and uh, I kept on looking at him and I knew, I knew the face. Mm -hmm. um, so I was with um, Tabani Mbofu, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. who is now in the president's office. Oh, right, yes. And I asked him, 
who is that? Yeah. And he told me he's head of CID. And he immediately moved away from where we were and got to the other side of the room. Mm. My friends kept on saying, why didn't you greet him? But Beatrice said, I think you did the right thing mm. to just look at him at a distance. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned in your book, um, Mararike and Broderick. Were those uh, fellow prisoners or uh, they were part of the team that was beating you up? Broderick was, uh, Broderick Takawira was the other staff, staffer from ZPP uh -huh. was also abducted. All right. Uh, after a week, they abducted two staff members from ZPP, mm -hmm. Broderick Takawira mm -hmm. and Pascal, and Pascal Gonzo. Mm -hmm. The Mararike guy, I'm not even sure if it was his real name, mm -hmm. but that's what they called him. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were using their real names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, you said, you know, when we started, when something like this happens to you, you, you can never be the same again. Mm -hmm. You have undergone therapy, am I right? I have, Trevor. Yeah. Um, it has been drawn out several years. Um, but every time, you know, December 3 comes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even when mm -hmm. I started working on the book, it wasn't easy because at times I would sit there and as I'm writing, I could actually, you know, mm. um, hear these people breathing. Mm. There was a time when I was in New York. I woke up all sweaty um, and I then looked around and got the relief that I was far away from Zimbabwe because I had a dream that mm. I was being abducted mm. Mm. again. Um, and so, um, initially I, people thought I had gone through the first phase of therapy and I was okay. I wasn't. I couldn't sleep. Mm. I was on sleeping tablets, but I think they were not working anymore. Because mm. I would take a tablet by 1 a.m., I would be wide awake. Mm. I could actually hear dogs, cats moving around uh, and maybe I would then fall asleep maybe five o'clock when people are now uh, going to wake up or I on going to five I would have these palpitations thinking that those people would be back again so I was fortunate enough to get people who funded my therapy I went to South Africa at the Denmark clinic, which is where my son also got therapy. So your son also got therapy? Yes, mm. my son also got therapy. But still, um, for that one, I actually got treatment for six months. Uh, they put me on medication for mm. six months. Mm. And on the first day that I woke up at nine, my son literally jumped up and down and said, I can't believe that you can actually sleep. sleep. I had turned into a zombie, Trevor. I no longer knew I was a mother. I would just sleep there. And after I started taking that medication, I remember there was one time, it was just the two of us in South Africa, and I went all out to make a special meal for us. And I had not done that in a long time. Wow. You know, just, I think to my son, it was his mother mm -hmm. coming back. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very difficult time. You know, you hear someone turning the key. And if anyone just forgot to lock the door, I got so irritable. Mm -hmm. And you know, one time... My, my brother then said, it's not there. They're also human. They will forget. Yeah. T tell me, they are also human. They will forget. What goes through your mind when you think of the Simon guy and so forth? Have you forgiven them? What's your state of mind? I think when I went through my last sessions of therapy, with this amazing um, woman named Val. Um, I, st 
started to realize my life needed to go on. Because somehow I felt that by holding on to the anger and the pain, the anger and the pain was not going to the people no, where it's, it was it's, supposed to. It was eating, eating me you. up. So I recognized I needed to let go. To let go. And um, having been raised as a Christian, I, I thought, well, uh, I can't talk, even talk about revenge. Because um, I think initially when I came out, yeah, that's what I was, was thinking that they needed to be um, in front of a firing mm. squad. That's how I felt. Mm. But with time, all those things have changed. Mm. And, um, well, I have gone on with my life, mm. but that dent will never mm. be removed. Forgiven, then, forgiven, but not forgotten. Yeah. 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 They, they, their names will always be etched mm. there. Mm. And I think the most painful part is also that there isn't this culture of people then acknowledging mm. what they have done. Mm. It could make a difference. Yeah. Because all these guys, they were protected mm. by a certificate that was issued mm. by then mm. Minister of State Security. Wow. So they to were think, not identified. To think, to think, Justina, that as we're sitting here having this conversation mm -hmm. and as the world is watching this conversation, mm -hmm. the men and women who tortured you yes, are walking are the streets of Harare. They are still out there probably doing the same thing and torturing mm. other people. Wow. Um, then you, the, um, the Supreme Court in 2009, uh, a full bench, mm -hmm. uh, found you not guilty of the charges that mm -hmm. uh, these guys were bringing against you and dropped all charges against mm -hmm. you. Um, so you were found innocent after having gone through what you went through. What went through your mind when the Supreme Court pronounced that verdict? You know, when I got the call from Harrison Como to tell me that the judgment was going to be delivered, this was three months down the line, I thought, but why have they done it so quickly? Mm. Because Mrs. Mtetwa had uh, told me that it might take two or three years before they deliver a judgment. So that's what I was thinking. And now this was just three months and they were ready to deliver the judgment. And what was going through my mind mm -hmm. was, mm. I think probably the state might have won in this. And um, when I went to court on that day, you know, it didn't even take long for them to deliver yeah. the judgment that they had unanimously agreed that my rights had been violated. And therefore, they were agreeing that there be a stay of criminal mm. prosecution. Mm. I just saw tears mm. rolling down mm. and um, felt vindicated. But at the same time, also thinking about how I had been bruised and how my entire family had been bruised. Um, being termed a class D prisoner and staying at Chikurubi Maximum Security Prison for 68 days was no mean feat. Um, you know, when you go out, you are in leg irons, you are in handcuffs. Humiliation, dehumanization. Oof. You know, the first day that I went into court like that, my son was sitting in the first row with my brothers. I felt I had, I had disappointed him as, a, as the only surviving parent. And that took a very long time for me to um, remove it from my head. It was only my therapist who said, it seems there is something that continues to draw you back. What is it? 
So I spoke about this. And she said, why don't you speak to your son about it? It took a long time. And you did. For me to get that courage. Mm -hmm. He loves crime and investigation. Mm -hmm. So we were watching together. And this person was handcuffed. And I thought that was my opportunity mm -hmm. to ask. And then said, Takudzko, how did you feel when you saw me the first time in handcuffs and also leg irons? Did you know I was in leg irons? Mm. Said, how could I miss you in leg irons when the chains were going clink mm. on, the, on the wooden floor? Mm. But he started welling in his eyes and he said, I was not disappointed at all, mommy. Mm. I actually thought, there is my mother representing mm. you know i felt relief mm. and that has also helped in, in your terms healing. of my healing yeah. yeah what did your son teach you during this this moment the way he reacted and responded to your deal he taught me that a child can actually be very mature mm. he would have bible verses done in small pieces of paper and uh, he would strike relationships with the uh, prison wardens and just put in their hands and wow. say, go and give that to my mother. Wow. So every day he came, I knew he would, be, he would be sending that. And the fact that he was courageous to take the phone and call people and let them know that my mm -hmm. mother has been abducted. Mm -hmm. He's 30 years old He's now. 30 now. How is he doing? Um, I always think about this and say, people wounded my son. Mm. Because at that time, because I was always in the news, mm. automatically he became a celebrity. Oh, right. Especially with girls. Oh. And that kind of disturbed him, even at school. And uh, I always think, if this had not happened, um, no, because he doesn't use my surname. No one really would have known that he is my son. So that as well has had a dent on, on him. him. Yeah. And I blame all this for him to have mm. been affected that mm. way. Y the writing of the book, um, was it a process towards closure? Painful? How was it like? When the thoughts about putting this on paper came to me, initially I thought, I'll just get a ghost writer to do it. Mm. But um, when I reviewed the work later on, I recognized that my soul was missing from it. Mm. Um, and my therapist continued to encourage to say, it will be a process in terms of your in terms of your healing. At times I would probably just punch in maybe 150 words and I would not be able to carry on. But at the end of the day I was able to finalize it and um, I always wanted to tell my own story. I did not want it to be told mm. by anyone else. So when I finished this book, I thought even if I died, my story is recorded mm. and it will be told in my own words and what I experienced. Mm. And indeed, it was therapeutic mm. going through mm. writing the book. Mm. But there was one of the therapists who said, you also need to be careful in terms of the people that you want to bring close to contribute to the book. Maybe your family is not even ready to go back to those years. Mm. Um, I remember one time asking my son, um, do you remember the name of that other brown dog that mm. we had? Mm. And he was like, why, 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 why do you need that name? And I recognized the therapist mm. was right. Mm. He did not want to, to go, go there. Back, to go there. Um, but those dogs were very important to me because on that particular day, I don't know how I missed it, that if anyone was at the gate, they would come to my bedroom. And they did. And they would bark 
But on that particular day, they did they not didn't. because they, the, the helper outside had been greased. Hmm. So he, yeah, he had taken the dogs and uh, put them in earlier than usual. So that when these guys came, it would, they would not come and bark um, at my window. Sure. Yeah. They had greased his hands. So clearly they, they had done some work around the people right around you. I was actually told that, that for two weeks they had been going around mm. the house. Mm. Um, I, I know you, your eyesight is um, problematic. Is there any part in this book that you would want me to read? I think the very first part, the very first part. which speaks to me getting into court. Mm -hmm. um, so this is chapter one, um, the prologue, page two. I trudge into court room six. It is 15 January 2009. And this is my fourth court appearance since Christmas Eve, 2008. Mm -hmm. The trial was supposed to start at 11.15, but the prosecution team was more than an hour late. My three brothers with their trademark bald heads and my son, Takudwa, lined up in the first row, all wearing silent faces. I avoid looking my son in the eye. Somehow, I feel... I failed him as a mother. This is a painful book to read, but I think it's a, it's a book that all Zimbabweans yeah. must read. Exactly, so that people are aware of yeah. what happens yeah. when someone tells you they've been abducted. Mm. I was also made to kneel on gravel. You know, initially when they said when this guy came in with two mounds of gravel and spread them where I was. I thought it was going to be a piece of cake. Kneel on them. Kneel on them. And this, I was kneeling while I was being interrogated for a good two hours. On gravel. I knelt on gravel. You know, the small stones mm. started piercing my knees. Mm. And the pain was out of this world. The pain was numbing. I remember uh, thinking that um, there was this woman. I think somehow something left my body. Mm. I don't know how that happened. But I saw myself seeing this woman watching yourself yes going through this excruciating mm. so there was the beating mm -hmm. under your feet yes kneeling on gravel what else and then just the psychological yeah. Yeah. where you have to knock on the door to go to the bathroom and you put on your blindfold mm. if they are taking you out you are in blindfold um, you don't even know who is around you. You are told to get into a car. You are not sure of mm. who else is in the car. Mm. One day they took me on a very long drive. I don't know where they took mm. me. On that particular day, I actually thought... They were going to kill you. They were going to kill me. Mm. You, 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 um, you say, um, I came out of this experience not a bitter person, but a better person. Help me understand what that means. The work that I do is related to victims of injustice. Coming out of this, I actually recognized and realized and understood if someone told me they had been abducted and they had been tortured. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what they are talking about. Hmm. And when I look at people's eyes, I remember looking at Tawanda Mchehiwa's eyes when he first came out hmm. of the abduction. I said to myself, this young man must have gone through a lot hmm. because the eyes speak, hmm. even without anyone opening their mouth. 
but I understood better things that happened um, in the dark. And I think that's where I then also then found my uh, motivation and energy mm. to carry on. Mm. So you, you were awarded damages, 100,000 US. It's US, eh? Or it's, is it uh, R R RTGS? <laughs> and 50,000 for legal costs. Yes. What does this mean to you? For me, I think for principle's sake, because the Constitutional Court had found that the state was guilty mm. through its agents, mm. that needed to be done. Mm. But when you look at the amount, that amount was not it's a going... Joke. It's a it's joke. It's an insult. It is an insult. You can say that again. Mm. Yeah. But I think where I was at the time, you also realize that it also came ages after. Mm. I think yeah. 10 years yeah. after. Um, I also was not in the mood to mm. carry on. Mm. Because it brings things reviving, back again. Yeah. Um, tell, opening. Tell me, um, um, tell me, Justina, there's been so many other people that have been abducted. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is still going on. Yes. What, what's your sense about this? And what happens to you when you hear the MDC women have been abducted, mm -hmm. abducted students have been abducted? Mm -hmm. um, my sense is this has always been the modus operandi of dealing with people with dissenting views even during colonial mm. times. And it continued mm. during the Mugabe era. But let's not also forget that a lot of the people in the new dispensation were also part of, of the Mugabe of um, system. Yeah. And uh, I have no reason to doubt when people say they have been abducted, abducted and tortured. Mm. I would be the last person not to believe them. Mm. Uh, because the pain that you go through when you are abducted and tortured, mm. you cannot inflict that mm. on your own. Mm. And uh, Trevor, you are aware our police are very good if they want to do stuff. Mm. They actually have a very good reputation even in the Southern African region. How can they fail to nail abductors. Mm. They are failing to nail them because they are also complicit mm. in it. Mm. Otherwise, the issue of us talking about a third hand, mm. a third force, mm. let's look and isolate that mm. third, force third force so that it doesn't continue to do this mm. and it will then separate you from these ills mm. that have become the mainstay of Zimbabwe since independence. It is clear to me, Justina, that this did not break your spirit, point number one. Point number two, it has not silenced you. Am I right that it has actually made you even much more courageous? I think you're right. What it did initially was to dim mm. my smile. Mm -hmm. I remember one of my friends one time after one of my therapies, he said, I'm so happy, Justina. You can now smile. <laughs> there you're smiling, <laughs> laughing. <laughs> but at the end of the yeah. day, I feel I, I have a role to play mm. because people put their heads on the block mm. for me, mm. locally, mm. regionally, mm. and internationally. Mm. And I also have a role to play mm. in terms of ensuring that issues that are related to injustice are brought exposed. to light yes. and exposed. Mm. Let's, let's talk about this person called Justina <laughs> Mukoko. Where were you born? I was born talk in... Talk to me about where you were born. I was born How in... How you were raised. I want the audience to understand 
the beautiful soul and the beautiful person <laughs> that you are. I was born in Gweru mm. at Mtapa Clinic. Yeah. Um, in 1967, it was just a year before my grandmother passed on. Mm. And uh, she had been beaten to uh, naming my sister by her daughter. Mm. And so when I was born, I'm told that she celebrated mm. and said she was ready to be with the Lord mm. because there was someone she could give her name. My middle name is Mungarewa. Mm. And so I inherited all my grandmother's names, Justina, Justina. and Mungarewa. Mm. And Mungarewa is so fitting in that um, I was told that my grandmother was saying that it was a name she was given by her parents because people were just talking in the village. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the parents then said, well, Munugona mm Kungoreva, -hmm. Mungarewa Henyu, because we, are, uh, we come from Manikaland. Mm -hmm. But my father moved from Rusape to Gweru where he was working as um, in the kitchen. Mm. Uh, and then he went back, took his mother, and stayed with his mother mm. in Gweru. So that's the home that we know. But from grade three, I moved from Gweru where to was Bulawayo. That? Where, where, which, which school did you go to for grade three? I went to Mkhali Primary School. Oh, wow, okay. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. mm. uh, I was now uh, living in with Magwegwe. my, in Magwegwe mm. with my uh, aunt's daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I learnt my Debele. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, this is the Justina that you know. And that made me then get into ZBC because secondary I school? had secondary, secondary school. school I went to Evelyn Girls High School okay in Bulawayo uh, and in, also in Bulawayo in Bulawayo yes it was Evelyn Girls High School and then Fletcher where I did my A levels okay yeah and then from there from there the University of Zimbabwe what did you study at the University of I Zimbabwe I studied politics and administration mm -hmm. yes and then you uh, went to, soon after you said you went to ZBC Soon after UZ, I actually taught okay. in Gweru. Okay. So I started at St. Patrick's mm. Secondary School and then went to Matinunura mm -hmm. um, High School in Mukoba. Mm. But uh, I believe I was not born a teacher. Mm. I did not like it. You did not like it. Uh, and then when I got the opportunity at ZBC, I grabbed it mm. with both hands. So for years, you were the face of uh, prime uh, ZBC, even, even news. Yes. Talk to me about the highlights of that uh, part of your life. Wow. Um, I think when I started, I was on the National Languages Desk where I would translate news from English to Shona and Debele. Mm. And I would be on radio and also the six o'clock news. But I always dreamt about being an anchor on the flagship bulletin. Mm. So I kept on trying to um, uh, practice doing this. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get a mentor in the late Shingrai Tungwarara. Mm. Um, I, I loved being under his wing. Mm. He was a professional mm. journalist. Some of the things that we see happening on the main news now would never see the light of day during Tungwarara's time. ZB has, ZBC rather has produced uh, amazing people. Uh, people like you, mm -hmm. Wayne Mukwetekwa, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and many others, yeah. uh, Shingra, Shingai Mutu, what's his name, by the way? Um, Shingrai Tungwara. Tungwara, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. all those uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Ama amazing people. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, did you sense the political interference in terms of editorial when you were there? Do you, do you remember any instances? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think from about 1999. Uh, to 2000, when I eventually broke ranks with um, ZBC. Um, like I was saying that when we started, we were guided mm. by journalistic ethics and also the issue of informing, mm. um, educating the nation. Mm. Um, 
And then late 1999-2000, the editorial policy was transformed. Mm -hmm. I remember it was over the weekend and uh, news had come through the wire. Mm -hmm. And the sub-editors would then just edit the news and give it to the readers to, to, to read. I remember um, Episode Chichetere was the one on duty that particular weekend. And this was news that was talking about the killing of the white farmer in Murewa. Mm. Um, and he said something came through the wires. They said, yes, we have already edited. Mm -hmm. He said, can you give me all the copies and the original wire? And when it came back, mm -hmm. it was totally different. Wow. We could not believe what we saw and what we were made mm. to read. You then begin to recognize, how can I be part, part of, of this? Things. But for me, I think what then made me call it a day, it was actually over a weekend, it was a Saturday, I had been given my bulletin, I had gone through it, and um, um, we were towards the elections in June 2000. And there were two stories. There was a story on Morgan Changirai holding a rally in Mutare. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a story on museums, national archives, where the late Dumiso Tabengwa um, was being interviewed. The Mutare story, which was related to the elections, which I thought needed to have more airplay because it was meant to inform the citizens and educate them about what was happening around them at that particular time mm. because we're due to have an election. I think it was less than 30 seconds. Mm. And then the National Archives story went on for a good three minutes. Mm. And I said to the producer, but why? He said, uh, that's instruction that mm. I got. Mm. I then said to myself, I think that was my cue to leave. Mm. Do you recognize ZBC when you look at it now? It's, um, it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> because like I'm saying, some of the things that I hear mm. on the news being made into news items would never, never have, have seen yeah. the light of day during that time. Mm. Well, when you look back at your life, mm. all that you've endured, mm. what's the biggest lesson that life has taught you? Your life has taught me that um, um, there are changes that will come, but uh, you can learn to live with those changes. Mm -hmm. uh, I recall in 2013, 2014, I got a fellowship to go to the UK and I was taken to a place called Northumberland and we would have um, a movement around um, the field. Mm. And we came across what they called an elephant tree. When you look at it, it looks like an elephant. And it was all because of a storm that it ended up like that. Mm. And uh, I have appreciated that uh, out of the storm, I have become an elephant just mm. like that wow. tree. And I'm learning to live as an elephant mm. so that that does not put my energies down. Any regrets? None. None. It was a painful experience, but I think um, it has, it made me grow. Mm. Yeah, it's a painful experience which you went through. For me listening to you tell it, it breaks my heart. Uh, like I said, it, it reminds me of just how 
cruel as human beings we can be, we to, can each be to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and to think that the people that did this to you mm -hmm. are walking the streets, they are free. Mm -hmm. To think that the same people that did this to you could actually be the ones that are responsible for the 13 or 14, even more other abductions yeah. that have taken place. Mm -hmm. That's frightening, that's saddening mm -hmm. in, in, in many respects. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Justina, you are a hero to many young men, mm -hmm. young women. Mm -hmm. Do you have a particular message for the girl child who is struggling to make ends meet? Do you have a, a, a message for the young women mm -hmm. who are um, trying to play their role mm -hmm. in um, helping us have a better society in this country, who are facing the oppression, mm -hmm the difficulties, mm -hmm. the fear, mm -hmm. the intimidation, afraid to speak out. Do you have any message for them? To the young women who are struggling where ends will not meet, let me say I grew up in the same situation. Mm -hmm. I lost my father when I was five. And um, my mother looked after us selling what are called doilis, going to tourist mm. resorts. Mm. But the months were never the same. Mm. At times I would go to school not knowing what Vaseline is, mm. but just looking on the bright side. Mm. So um, life is there for us. And as young women, young girls, um, they need to be able to um, look to the future and also um, probably prioritize their education. Mm -hmm. I know it's difficult when I talk about education at the moment, especially in light of COVID-19, mm -hmm. where the um, less privileged girl mm -hmm. has no access to classes mm -hmm. online. Mm. Not because of their choice, but the situation that they find themselves mm. in. Mm. What I'll say, even if you have to uh, burn the midnight oil reading, you need to get mm. an education. Mm. The, the, the sun will always come out. Mm. And then for the young women who are out there, who are already role models mm. because there is something that you are doing well mm. they will come after you let them not break your spirit wow. allow them to uh, do whatever they do to your body but do not allow them to break your spirit wow. because at the end of the day dawn will come mm. yeah help the audience understand Justina, your current job, what it entails, uh, and what you do on a day-to-day -to -day basis. It's good that you ask this, because whenever I meet people, they are like, "Where are you working now?" I say, "Why do you say where now. am I working now? I'm still there." <laughs> oh, they didn't fire you. I said, no, I did not commit a crime. <laughs> So I'm still at the Zimbabwe Peace Project. As executive director. As the national director. Yeah. But uh, there's always been a perception out mm. there that I'm the founding director mm. of ZPP. Mm. I am not. Okay. There were actually two, if not three, directors mm. before me. I mm. only joined the organization mm. in 2007. Mm. The organization having, found, having been founded in the year 2000. Mm. At one time when I was called out to the police, when um, Augustine Chihuri made this announcement when he was still Commissioner General of mm. Police to mm. say, Justina Mukoko is on the run. Mm. Um, you know, getting to the police because Beatrice had insisted, no, you need to be speaking to the board members mm. because they are the owners of the organization. They mm. said, we don't want to hear that. We know the organization is yes. So she is the one who is supposed to come and answer. Mm. So this organization, I'm really grateful mm. 
to those who conceived it. Mm. So we monitor and document mm. human rights mm. abuses. Right. And we name and shame perpetrators mm. because it's not the right thing to do not to allow other people mm. to enjoy mm. and exercise mm. their rights. Mm. So we operate through um, a strong network mm. of courageous men and women throughout the country. Who are throughout the country. Mm. And at one time when I was being interrogated, I was asked to write the name of the names of these men and women. I said I don't know them. Mm. Because I was being told that how do you get the information because some things happen at 2 a.m. you get it correct mm -hmm. in your in your reports. Mm -hmm. And we also we are also involved in peace building mm -hmm. in selected communities. Mm -hmm. um, and at the moment we are running with the campaign as an organization where we are saying Zimbabweans need to resist, reject, and report violations as we head up to the 2023 elections. We have actually launched an app, it's called Spec App, mm -hmm. and we are saying to Zimbabweans, if you witness or you go through a violation, report so that we know what is happening in your communities. Mm -hmm. I'm also the current chairperson of the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum, right. which also leads the human rights agenda. Mm. Yes. Um, have you noticed any difference, if any, uh, with the new dispensation in terms of abuse of human rights? And as we run into the elections, what, 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 are, what are you picking up as far as violation of uh, people's rights is concerned? What we are actually picking up is that the human rights violations that we have noted from the shooting of citizens on the streets of Harare August. on the 1st of mm. August 2018, mm. they are more brazen, they are more gross mm. as compared to what we saw mm. in the 37 years. So I think something needs to be done if that new dispensation label mm. is to stick. Mm. Mm. You're not seeing it no. as far as human rights is concerned? No. Yeah. No. I think we have a human rights crisis. Mm. And, and what you have taught us through your life and through the book and what you've said, you know, reminds me of what Nelson Mandela said, that um, not forgiving somebody mm -hmm. is like drinking poison and, and hoping that is going to hurt the other guy. Instead, you forgive you. and it removes the burden of mm -hmm. you. Don't keep it inside, exactly. and you've done that uh, very well. Um, Justina, we love books in this show. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> delighted that you have written this book, yeah. which I'm recommending to all Zimbabweans, Africans on the continent and all over the world. An amazing, mm -hmm. painful story, yeah. but worth uh, reading. reading. What stories have you, what, what books rather have you read, Justina, that you'd want to, to share with our book living audience? Uh, I have read Becoming mm. and uh, I've also read uh, The Purpose Driven Life. Right. It actually helped me heal. Um, we require speaks about do not question why it happened to, to you. me he says the lord could have spared his son his only begotten son we saw what he went through but he did not what would be so special about justina mm. not going mm. through pain mm. yeah so those two, those two books, books stand out for mm. me. Mm. Chestina, your life, as painful as the ordeal uh, was, um, is so full of instructive lessons. And uh, I just want to say thank you for finding the courage <laughs> to continue telling the story and for that smile. <laughs> I love that smile. Thank you for that smile. 
um, the courage to keep on smiling, having endured what you endured. You are a role model, model to many. We live in a society where people's human rights are trampled upon, yeah. taken for granted. Mm -hmm. But the, your story says it's important to stand up yes. and speak out. And, speak out. and hopefully yeah. this message gets out to people. So thank you so much thank you for so much. creating the time. I've been chasing you around and finally <laughs> pinned you down. I'm delighted. Thank you, Trevor. After the two <laughs> fails, I was like, OK. Yeah. No, but finally making it to in conversation with Trevor. Mm. I'm so happy. Fantastic. Thank you. Allow me, Justina, to tend to our audience who are in Zimbabwe, uh, on the continent, all over the world, who have made this show the success that it is to say thank you for watching in conversation uh, with uh, Justina Mukoko. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, it has uh, inspired you. Remember, we are a weekly show. We are out at 7 a.m. Central African time every Monday. And to ensure that you don't miss out on any of these quality conversations, I invite you to click on this red button and you get an alert every time we have one of these quality conversations. We've gone a step further and created podcasts for you. Scroll under this video, click onto the podcast for your listening pleasure. Until next time, Cheers to you all.